So we'll get started with stats. Stats is analyzing data. If you go to university and you're not going to be studying something strongly in mathematics, any other subject probably would be like, oh, the math we would like you to take is statistics. Because we use statistics everywhere in our lives. Univariate analysis, and the word uni means one, and variate is like variable, is a single variable. We just gather the shoe sizes of everybody in class, then it's single variable univariate. And sometimes data is qualitative, in which case it's descriptive, and sometimes it's quantitative, where it's measured. So descriptive could be something like, how are you feeling today? It's not something that's usually measured. Uh, I was between 3.2 and now I'm feeling like a 3.23. Doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm having a great day. You guys are so lucky. Math at the end of the day, end your day with math. I'm, I have math all day, so I'm like super lucky all the time. Now quantitative data is either continuous or discrete. So example of discrete is if we were uh, getting shoe sizes, you have like size seven, seven and a half, eight. There's no, oh, I don't know, is there? There probably is now. Is there, can you buy seven and a quarter shoes? No. So there's full sizes like that. We would say that's discrete because there's bumps in between. Other things are continuous, like height. All the values are possible. If height was discrete, that you only grew an inch at a time, you would be like, you're exactly five foot six, and then the person, you notice they start to shake all of a sudden, they're, boom, instantaneously they're five foot seven. That would be crazy if height was discrete. But no, you gradually grow taller and grow shorter. So that means all the values are possible. And sometimes there's possible range, right? You never find someone who's, oh, I'm negative three feet tall, right? There's some values that don't make sense. So here we got the heights being continuous, but number of students that have a smartphone, can't say five and a half students. That's all right. So in statistics, we use the definition as population as all the people that you're trying to do the study for. So for example, if I was curious, um, what do students at Sturgeon Heights think about blah, 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 then my population would be all students at Sturgeon Heights, which is like 1,200, 1,300, just quite a few of you. It might be like, ooh, that's going to take too long to ask everyone. So instead, it often makes sense to take a sample. And a lot of statistics is about if we take a sample, how do we make sure that that sample tells us what we want? I want to know what all students think. If I only ask you guys in the class and take that as this is what all students think, it might be different. You guys are in grade 12. You're going to have a different perspective of what's important than students in grade 9. You guys are all highly academic, taking tougher classes, preparing you for university. You're going to want your school to do more of that as opposed to someone who's like, no, I want to go into a trade. I don't think the school should have this as a requirement or something like that. So we want things to be, when we take a sample, to be random. If a sample is truly random, everybody has the same chance of being chosen. And if everyone has the same chance, then when you take a sample, it should be representative of the whole population.
Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid bias. So one of the things that we pull up, and this is something from the textbook, um, one of the units was a mathematical toolkit. That's the unit that I said isn't really a unit. We sort of look at it a little bit here and there. We do it focused for a little bit right before your internal assessment. But here's a situation. Um, for each of the following situations, explain how the sample procedure was biased, and you may like to research these situations further. So in 2013, Google used the number of people searching for flu-related terms on the internet to predict the number of people who would go to the doctor to seek flu treatment. Okay? In other words, thinking, if you search something, you probably they're thinking you have that ailment, and then you would go and see the doctor about it. They overestimated the true number by 140%. So why would that be? I don't know. Do you think some people are just checking anyways? Do you think sometimes you check for somebody else? It's during COVID. When was this? 2013. There would be a lot of searching about the flu and stuff like that during that time. 1936. Literary Digest used a poll of 10 million people with 2.4 million responses to predict the outcome of the presidential election. They got the result spectacularly wrong. But George Gallup, have you ever heard of a Gallup poll? That's named after this guy. Predicted the correct result by only asking 50,000 people. Which is crazy. How did he figure out which 50,000 to ask, and that's not very many. Maybe he just got lucky. As opposed to a 10 million person poll, right? Well, Literary Digest, you're already, that sort of makes me think of one group of people already. So now you're taking from like-minded people, even though you had 2.4 million responses, they're all like-minded, could throw things off. And this is the greatest one. Boston created an app for reporting potholes. And the least damaged roads got repaired, and the most damage didn't. Why would that happen? Maybe they don't drive on the worst roads, right? Who's going to report this? people who have the app. This is 2014, right? You have to have 2014. A lot of people have smartphones in 2014. Rich people have more smartphones. Did they figure out how to use it so that they could report it more often? And then, hey, if you get want your road fixed, put it on here. I'm not sure. So what we want to do is we want to avoid bias. So there's some sampling techniques. Now, the perfect one is completely random, right? You could, if I wanted a random sample of this class, I put all your names in a hat, pull out five, that would be random, okay? The problem with random is it's not always easy to do. So sometimes we need something Easy, but also random as well. So the most random, that's just simple, random sampling. Each individual has the same likelihood of being chosen, choosing names out of a hat. Okay, problem with this one, if it's super large, it's not always possible or feasible. But now we have computers. Computers can pick things randomly. Convenience sample. This is more prone to uh, bias. In a convenience sample, if you want 50 people, you just take the first 50 people you find. That was easy. That's why it's convenient. Could be more prone to bias because of who you chose, right? But if you think, the first 50 people could be random, maybe it's not that bad, depending on what you're doing and what you're asking. 
a systematic sample. So you pick a number, like I'm going to ask every fifth person. You get a printout of all the students in the school alphabetically. You randomly pick one of the people. This one has every ninth person. So you take from one to nine, you say, I'm going to start with person three. You do person three, then you do nine more, person 12. Nine more, person 21. You have it somewhat random that way. It should be random all the way through, but it's systematic, so it allows you to get the list easy. But it only help, it helps if you have a list. Stratified sample. So for example, if you wanted to ask 100 students, but you're like, we want to get opinions from grades 9, 10, 11, and 12, well, then you make sure we take 25 from 9, 25 from grade 10, 25 from grade 11, 25 from grade 12. Because even in a random sample, there's a possibility that you could be overloaded with more grade 12 students. So the strata is sort of like, first you break them into groups, and then you ask the groups what they want. Quota sampling, similar to strata sampling, but you have to meet a certain quota. So for example, if you know the entire population has a breakdown, in this case 60% female, 40% male, then your sample of 100, you ask until you reach a quota. And then like, okay, we've got enough uh, of, of females, the next three we have to ask our males. So you set a quota or an amount that you want from each one. So you could, do, you could do a quota sampling randomly for the school. You're asking 100, 100 students, but once you hit 25 grade nines, you no longer ask any more grade nines. Then you still randomize it until you get 25 of each one. So you can see why it's very similar to the stratified, but just a little bit different in its technique. All right. The beginning of statistics is a lot of definitions. So I'm kind of getting a little antsy. I want to get to some math. So this is a little bit closer to getting some math. A frequency table. Gathering data is an easy way to view data quickly and look for patterns. So what we have here is Scientists counting how many fish were caught every day. And it's just a list of data. This data, the way that it's listed right now, just seems like a bunch of numbers. It doesn't really tell you much. You can't really infer much from it right away. But if we make a frequency table, and we say number of fish caught, count it up for each one, it sort of organizes it a little bit better. And once it's organized that way, you can also take this organization and put it into a bar chart. So what I have here is I labeled frequency on the y-axis, number of days, and then down here, number of fish caught. And that visual tells us some more information. So the way that we present data can give us more or less information. And then there's been lots of arguments about how data is presented. Because if somebody wants you to see something, they can manipulate their graphs to push their point of view. So one of the things that we want to be is critical of how data is presented.
So we can create and get some statistics from our calculator. And this is going to be a heavy calculator unit. So we're first going to enter our data into list one. So I'm going to pull up the calculator on the screen as well. Unless they didn't put it back on for me. There we go. Beginning of the year, you always find out what apps they put on your computer and which ones they erased and didn't put back on their computer. But it does look like I have the graphing calculator. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the calculator to find out a bunch of information. The way that we do this is I just can't read the buttons on there. Go to, sorry, hit the stat button and then hit edit. And list one, list two, list three, list four, list five, list six come up. If a list is missing, we can bring it back. If you don't have a list one, there's ways to get it back. Generally speaking, you want to, even though it seems intuitive, if you want to delete all the data in list one, you don't go up to list one and hit delete, because then it gets rid of your list one completely. Instead, we'll learn that you can hit, it's tricky, you have to push the clear button and the down button, clear and then down, and then it clears everything down. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all this data into the list. So you've got 10 and then 12, You have a Casio. Do you know how to use your Casio? And you should make sure you get the other calculator. It's way better. But you okay? Otherwise, you have to for everything. You'll have to read the instructions to figure out because I'll always show with this one. First, it's just the stat button. Stat button and then enter on edit. There you go. We want, you can just type over these or I can just go through there down. There we go. So the stats unit is a lot of answers you get just from your calculator. So it's not like you're doing very much math at all. So the number one thing you have to be careful with is that you're putting in the data correctly. Because if you put in one number wrong, then all of your answers will be wrong as well. Right? So once you've got your data in here, right? we've entered in all of that data, you can hit the stat button again, and this time arrow over to the right to calculate. And since we just had things in list one, 
we can go to number one, one, one variable statistics, push enter. It just has a list in list one. We do not have a frequency. Now, depending on the version of calculator that you have, some will come up with a menu like this. Others will just go one var stats and you push enter. Once you push enter, it starts giving you all sorts of answers. The X with the bar over top is the average. Did I type a number in wrong or did you get the exact same number? Same number? Okay. So chances are we did the same thing. It tells you if you wanted to add up all the numbers, you would get 433. That's nice to know. If you wanted to square every number and add it up, you would get 64,000 or 6,489. And there's actually reasons you would want to do these things. Okay? It has a population standard deviation and a regular standard deviation. We don't know what that number means yet, but that will be a very important number. We will be using the one with the baby sigma sign. Did you know, do you know Greek letters? Do you know, like, have you seen that one in geometric sequences and arithmetic sequences for a sum? That's the capital letter sigma. The little letter sigma, like, I don't know how that grows up to look like that. They don't, they don't look very much the same. But baby sigma and adult sigma. So that one we are going to be using. But the ones that are going to be important for right now is this average is going to be important. And then if we scroll down, hit the down button, it tells you n, how many data points we had, 30 of them. The smallest one was 10. The largest one was 18. The median is the one right in the middle. So for example, if you had five data points and you arranged them from smallest to biggest, this is not a good example. Can you see which one is the middle one? I won't use a visual to show you that. But the third one would be the middle value. And so whatever the third one is. If you had four data points, there's no one in the middle. There's two on the left, two on the right. Then you take the middle two and find the average of them. So that's what happened here with 30 things. They looked at the 15th one and the 16th one and took the average of those and found out that the middle was 14.5. Q1 and Q3 stand for quartile one and quartile three. Meaning that if your median is the one in the middle, quartile one is the middle of the first half. In other words, the first quarter. And quartile three is the middle of the second half, which is like the 75th percentile, or halfway between 50 and 100. So this is just telling us information about this data. And your calculator can calculate all of these things fast. If you wanted to find the average, can you see that you could add them all up and divide by 30? That would just be slow. Can you see if you wanted to find the one in the middle, you could rewrite the list from smallest to biggest and then find the one in the middle. Again, time consuming and annoying. So we find out that a lot of statistics the mathematics you actually have to do is very time consuming. So we use a lot of technology to get us the answers quickly so we can analyze them and figure them out. Now, we could take that same data that we had before. Remember the data with the fish? And we made a frequency chart for it. So on our calculator, We can again go to the stat and edit. If you want to erase what you had before, you go up to list one, hit the clear button, 
and then push down and erase the data that we had before. So now our fish numbers were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And in list two, we're going to put the frequencies 3, 3, 4, 3, 2, 2, 2, 5, 6. How many items are here in total? Well, if we add up all the frequencies, 11, 13, 15, 17, 20, 30 of them, if we add up all the frequencies, we find out that there are 30 things in total. If you were given a frequency chart like this, this could be an example of an IB question on do you understand what the median is? The median, if you had 30 things, is going to be between the 15th and the 16th one because it's an even number, so you have to know which number is the 15th number, which number is the 16th number. How would I figure that out? Well, there's going to be three tens, then three elevens, that's six numbers, then four twelves, that's ten numbers, thirteen numbers. Can you see that the 15th number is a 14th? And the 16th number is a 15th. So from this chart, I can see that the median is going to be 14.5. When we go to our calculation here, so again, hit the stat button and then go over to calculate. Now, in the calculator, you put the list as list one, and then in frequency, you're going to have to write list two. List two is in blue above my number two, so I have to hit second, list two, and then I can go down and calculate. And we have the same numbers as before using the frequency chart. For those of you that when you put it in and it just lists, it says one var stat, then you're going to have to type the following so it looks like this, right? Because it doesn't it come up just one var stat and then nothing's written? How many people have a calculator like that? That's a typical one. Then you're going to have to write list one and then comma list two. So it just depends on which operating system it has. Some of the newer ones have newer operating systems. Some of you who have older ones will upgrade them to a newer operating system. If you rent a calculator this semester from the library, make sure they give you a TI-84. Say, I'm taking an IB class, so you have to give me a nicer one. All right, so there are some calculator things The next thing we're going to look at is how to draw graphs like a bar graph is called a histogram, but a histogram has no gaps between the bars, and a bar graph does. In a histogram, you always make the width of what you're looking at the same, so it has the same width all the way through. So we call that the class width. Sometimes you're looking at what are students' marks? How many students got between 40 and 50, 50 and 60, 60 and 70, 70 and 80? So then our class width would be 10. And we're organizing things that way. And we can create a histogram with the data that we had in our list from before. So we've got our data already. We just did that already. We put things into list one and list two. 
So let's follow the instructions here. So we've got our calculator. We can go to stat plot, which is above the y equals. So if you go second, y equals, your plots are either turned on or turned off. So we're going to go to the first one, and we're going to turn it on by pushing enter on on. And then you have options for your graphs. We're going to draw the histogram. It says, where is your X list? List one. Where is your frequency? Our frequency was in list two. Okay. And then when we hit graph, or hit zoom, and then we're going to graph number nine for statistics, it will draw a bar graph or histogram where things are connected together. And right now, if I arrow, if I want to change Right now, if I hit my window button and I change my scale to 1, then it makes each of my widths 1. So it's going to go from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 to 16 to 17 to 18. And it matches up my frequency that I had. And since I was going by ones before, that made sense to do. Now you're never going, this is just, you'll probably have to draw a histogram by hand more often than with a calculator, but it just shows that you can show that on your calculator as well. Now if you go to another class and you're graphing now, and you hit y equals, and you get errors, this may happen when you're working in a different class and you're trying to do something and you're getting an error. Do you notice above the y equals it has plot 1, plot 2, plot 3? Right now my plot 1 is turned on. If I highlight it and push enter, it just turns it off. It doesn't erase the data, but now you'd be able to do your math like before. Often if you have statistics at the same time as your regular math, they conflict with each other and you get errors and you're like, what's wrong with my calculator? So that's something that to look for. Do I have a plot turned on? Sometimes in previous years, people in chemistry turn their plots on in chemistry, and then they come to math, and they're like, my calculator's not working. That was mainly because of the plots. This is more likely what exam questions with histograms look like. Because drawing a histogram takes a long time. It's not a good question. Instead, they want you to be able to look at information and interpret it. So they give you the histogram. Okay? There's an age range. This first one says age ranges from 0 to 20. Notice that. They have to decide where the 20-year-old is going to fit in. Is the 20-year-old fit in the 0 to 20 or the 20 to 40 category? So you'll notice in the histogram that the lower number is included and the upper number isn't. So the 20-year-old would fit in the 20 to 40 category. Okay. The frequency is how high that histogram is. So the frequency there is 40. We would say that our mid-interval value is 10 that the average age of those between 0 and 20 is 10. And so we could fill out the rest of this chart, how many people between 20 and 40. And I'll get you to look at the data, fill it out quickly on your own. I'll put up the answer in a second.
So we would say the width of the interval is 20. Because the age difference between each line of the histogram is 20. What is the average age of the people in this village? If this is the only data you were given. So we don't know exactly how the 0 to 20 year, year olds are spread out. We just know that there are 40 of them. So what we do to estimate an average, does it make sense if by saying, well, let's just pretend everybody in those, all 40 of those are 10 years old. And all 70 of these are 30 year old. And in this, yeah, maybe as opposed to continuous, age is continuous, right? If it wasn't, it'd be like you're at 10 and then boom, you, you're 30. You're 10 for 20 years and then you turn 30 for the next 20 years. So if you wanted to calculate this by hand, you would have 40 10 year olds, 70 30 year olds. How would I write that? 40 times 10 plus 70 times the 30, plus 150 year olds, plus 57 year olds, plus 10 90 year olds, and that would on the top add up all the ages of everyone. And then you have 270 in total. So divide by 207. Your tiny bit of homework, the next two examples, I want you to do on your own and have them ready for next class. I'll put up the answers at the beginning of the class for you to check them. Also, read through the first lab. See which ones you feel like you understand. See which ones you don't. Maybe find your old notes or find your old workbooks or do some internet searching. And get a start on your first lap. So for next class, we've got example two and three with frequencies. I plan to get your textbooks ready uh, and uh, also have a look at your laps.